Thank you. You may be seated. And I welcome you to worship at the Ridley Park Presbyterian Church or through video uh, at the Ridley Park Presbyterian Church. You are all welcome and are, we are very happy that you have chosen to be here today. I have a few announcements to share with you. The cookbook recipe submission deadline has been pushed to October 31st. So you have another week Please get those recipes in. Um, it's a great way for us to see how each other cook and uh, spark discussions. Uh, it's also a great way to uh, raise funds for the church and just to sense our connectedness as a congregation. Information has been sent to you in the email uh, that you will have received if you're on our email list. Uh, and it's the, the cookbook document. And in there is the link for you to click on to um, be able to submit those recipes. If you are not comfortable with doing that online, just uh, give a call um, and one of us will be glad to help you to do that. Just submit your recipe uh, in you know, the old school way and uh, we will translate it for you into that digital format. We are collecting baby items, diapers, wipes, and baby lotion for Mother's Home, a center for expecting and new mothers in Darby, PA. Uh, and next week uh, is the deadline for that collection as well. So make sure to bring those in uh, next Sunday or sometime uh, during the week. We're partnering with the First Presbyterian Church of Glen Olden. I don't know if you've heard about their Thanksgiving outreach, but it is extensive. Uh, they serve many, many people Thanksgiving meals on Thanksgiving, and uh, last year did it through a takeout system. Uh, so uh, this year they're continuing that. They also provide gift cards to people, and they've asked us to partner with them in that. $25 gift cards to any number of uh, local businesses, uh, and there's a sign-up sheet uh, outside near the restrooms out here. Uh, the card that you are to get is a specific card uh, for specific people. So make sure to sign up for uh, one of those and take note of which card uh, to purchase and we can uh, bless people uh, this Thanksgiving season. Uh, we'd like to have this wrapped up by November 14th, so please sign up today and bring those cards in soon. Karen has resumed the Zoom watch group of The Chosen on Tuesdays from 7 to 8.30 on Zoom. If you would like an invitation to this, uh, send her an email at info at rppcusa.org. And new members classes begin this morning. We'll be uh, live and in person in the uh, parlor down the hall. Uh, if you are interested in learning more about the church and the possibility of joining the church, please join us there. Uh, if there's anyone who is uncomfortable meeting in person at this time, I uh, will be glad to set up a Zoom uh, class for you. I'd like, to, as we heard last week, of the wonderful mission of Child Evangelism Fellowship. We have, um, well, not necessarily one of our own, but she's, she's connected to one of our own. Carol Geddes' sister, Sandy Donnelly, works with Child Evangelism Fellowship, and she is going to come and share with us her role in that uh, organization.
Good morning, everyone. Uh, I've morning. been working with CEF for probably about, well, actually close to 20 years ago. I began as a volunteer, and then a few years after that, I came on staff. And uh, I'm part-time on staff, so I just get to do the fun stuff. I'm rarely in the office, not involved in any of the administration. Um, I just get to go out and do the fun stuff. Uh, I'm not a teacher by profession, but the Lord has given me a love of teaching, and I get to do it a lot in CEF. Uh, at least twice a week, I'm teaching a good news club. Uh, our good news clubs meet during the school year, uh, one day a week. Uh, we used to be doing them in schools. COVID kind of stopped that, but it actually had become difficult even before that because schools weren't allowing us to send flyers out, send invitations out with the kids. So we're now working on community good news clubs, which are starting to build. Uh, this will be held, they'll held at churches or community centers uh, anywhere in the county. In the summertime, our ministry is five day clubs and we train young people, teens and young adults that are interested in serving the Lord for the summer. Uh, we have a, a training camp in the spring, and we work with them so that they can, in fact, teach boys and girls. They can hold a club, play games, sing songs, and teach the boys and girls about Jesus. Uh, and that runs through the summer. And then another big part of our ministry is training adults. Um, and I love that part of it because as much as I want to teach boys and girls about Jesus, I can only do so much. But when I train others, my work can be multiplied. So that is something I really enjoy doing. Uh, we have a lot of seminars that we give, and occasionally we have our Teaching Children Effectively program. Typically that's maybe every other year. That's actually a 30-hour study. Uh, we run it over a period of, of eight or ten weeks, but it is an amazing program, and when I first took it, it actually revolutionized the way I teach children. It is a great course, and you might want to consider that if, you're, if you work with children at all. Uh, and just finally, I wanted to wrap up with the results from our walkathon. Uh, Brenda was here last week and told you folks about our walkathon. This is our, our biggest fundraising event of the year. And we had a goal of $20,000, and we were still far from that goal. And I know some of you people here donated to help us reach that goal. And the final total right now is over 22,000, 110% of our goal. <laughs> and you guys helped us do it. So right now, I need everybody, put your hand up. Come on, you can do it. Put your hand up. Turn it backwards. Bend your elbow, and give yourself a pat on the back. Great job. Thank you very much. Let us pray together. Holy God, we thank you for your goodness and your grace toward us. We thank you for the wonderful message that we can enjoy fellowship with you forever that you have conquered the power of death, that you have conquered the power of sin. And we know that this message is not one that everyone knows, so we pray that you would help us to reach out with that message, that truth that brings so much hope and peace. We pray for your blessing upon the Child Evangelism Fellowship of Delaware County and for uh, all of our mission partners. and. We also pray for us, for the Ridley Park Presbyterian Church. Strengthen us to be faithful to you and to be strong together in our witness for your goodness, your glory, your grace. We pray this in Jesus' name, amen.
You may be seated again and let us uh, confess our sin using the prayer that we looked at last week, uh, Psalm 51. And we'll read this respons responsively. I will be the leader and you can be the people. Let us pray. Have mercy on me, O God, according to your unfailing love, according to your great compassion, blot out my transgressions. Wash away all my iniquity and cleanse me from my sin. For I know my transgressions and my sin is always before me. Cleanse me with hyssop and I will be clean. Wash me and I will be whiter than snow. Let me hear joy and gladness. Let the bones you have crushed rejoice. Hide your face from my sin and blot out all my iniquity. You do not delight in sacrifice or I would bring it. You do not take pleasure in burnt offerings. Let us now silently confess our sins before God. Amen. Scripture assures us that if anyone is in Christ, there is a new creation. The old has passed away and everything has become new. All this comes from God who reconciled us to himself through Christ and gave us the ministry of reconciliation. That is God reconciling the world to himself, not counting their trespasses against them and entrusting the message of reconciliation to us. So we are ambassadors for Christ since God is making his appeal through us. We entreat you on behalf of Christ to be reconciled to God. For our sake he made him to be sin who knew no sin so that in him we might become the righteousness of God. Amen.
Thank you. You may be seated. Let us pray together. Thank you, Lord, for your word. For not only did you create us, not only do you have plans for us, plans ultimately for glory, but in your grace you reveal those plans to us. You tell us in your word about ourselves, and you tell us in your word about you. May we grow in our trust in you, in what you have revealed to us, in you as our salvation, as our hope, as our trust. We pray in Jesus' name, amen. Today we're looking at Psalm 62. Truly my soul finds rest in God. My salvation comes from him. Truly, he is my rock and my salvation. He is my fortress. I will never be shaken. How long will you assault me? Will you, all of you, throw me down this leaning wall, this tottering fence? Surely they intend to topple me from my lofty place. They take delight in lies. With their mouths they bless, but in their hearts they curse. Yes, my soul finds rest in God. My hope comes from him. Truly, he is my rock and my salvation. He is my fortress. I will not be shaken. My salvation and my honor depend on God. He is my mighty rock, my refuge. Trust in him at all times, you people. Pour out your hearts to him, for God is our refuge. Surely the lowborn are but a breath, the highborn are but a lie. If weighted on a balance, they are nothing. Together they are only a breath. Do not trust in extortion or put vain hope in stolen goods. Though your riches increase, do not set your heart on them. One thing God has spoken, two things I have heard. Power belongs to you, God. And with you, Lord, is unfailing love and you reward everyone according to what they have done. This psalm came at a good time for me. It's been a hard season for everyone, right? Um, I, I am, I'm humbled by healthcare professionals and others who put themselves uh, out there day by day. I read an article this week that one quarter of all teachers are thinking about quitting because this has been hard for them, not only the concerns of COVID, but the way people handle COVID. Some of them are being really mean. And it, the church is not exempt. This morning, as I drove here, I followed a family partway until they turned another direction, a family that has been part of this church, but is so no longer, because they didn't like how we handled COVID. There are others like that. Of course, this sanctuary is not nearly as full as it was two years ago. And we know there are a number of reasons for that. There are those who, and I spoke with a couple of them this week, who are concerned about being with a bunch of people. They are not going out until COVID quiets down more. So I know there are a number of people who are very faithful watching our services online. There are others whose lives are busy. That was the case before COVID, too. And then there are others that we don't see and we don't know why. And of course, those like the family I followed this morning who have decided not to be part of us anymore. And I know it's nothing like being a healthcare worker or probably even a teacher, but these things weigh heavily on a pastor.
And as I struggled with this, particularly hard early this week, I started reading commentaries and sermons for the passage I was going to preach on, and this is the, one of the, this is the first commentary I read, said this. Psalm 62 is tailor-made for troubled times in which the clamor and agitation, grasping materialism, and sheer meanness of society threatened, threatened the person who is trying to live a God-focused life. It's tailor-made. This psalm offers the answer. This psalm offers the hope. This psalm tells us that God is good, that we can continue to trust in God, that we need not and should not focus on our problems, on the challenges, but focus on the goodness of God who will carry us through whatever those challenges are. There's a word, it's a funny little word in the Hebrew, it's even funnier when you transliterate it into English. The word is ak, A-K. It is found as the first verse, as the first word in verse 1, in verse 2, in verse 4, in verse 5, in verse 6, and in verse 9 of this passage. And ak means only. Now, in, there are different ways of translating it. Here it says truly in verse 1, truly in verse 2, surely in verse 4, yes in verse 5, truly in verse 6, and then surely in verse 9. But the word uh, is, is a, it means yes, but it, it carries with it this strong sense of only. And the point is that our only hope, our only trust is in God. If you listened carefully, you'll notice, you will have noticed that verses 5 and 6 are pretty much exactly the same as verses 1 and 2. The only real difference in the Hebrew is that in um, verse 2, it says, God is my rock and salvation, my fortress, I will not be shaken much. In verse 6, it says, God is my rock and my fortress. He, I will not be shaken, period. And through the psalm, you see, as is typical of the psalms, the psalmist's strength and trust in God grows. And that is the case here, even between those two, um, two sets of verses that say basically the same thing. But in the middle is the challenge. And what is the challenge to the psalmist? It's people. People trying to take advantage of whatever weakness they see. The psalmist says he is a leaning wall, a tottering fence. Have you ever felt like that? Just one more thing would destroy you. That's how he feels here. And then to realize that there are people who want that to happen and some who would help it to happen, his destruction. And then those horrible words in the end of chapter, verse 4, with their mouths they bless, but in their hearts they curse. We see that all the time, don't we? Those friendly, friendly people, smiling, being nice to our faces. Makes you wonder if you can trust anyone, if the nice people are the ones that are out to get you. We can't trust people, unfortunately, not to the level at which we can trust God. And we'll get there a little later that we do, in fact, need people and trust people to a degree. But don't put your trust in people primarily. And we can't trust ourselves. The psalmist feels weak. The psalmist feels like he's about to be done in. I found an article this week that I clicked on. It was one of those that, you know, is an advertisement or something, but it was 
there in front of me, so I clicked on it because I related to it. It said, do you wake up at 3 a.m. and beat yourself up? And I'm like, yeah. <laughs> How did they know? It's either 3 or 4, depending on when I go to bed. And it was some scientific study that says it's how our brains work, that we get the, the good deep sleep early, and then we start the process of waking up, but we're not in a good place to process life, and we just beat ourselves up. And the best thing to do, the article said, was go back to sleep. I wish I could. But I found another best thing, a better thing, and that is to pray. To take that, those lies that we're telling ourselves and replace them with God's truth. Allow God to speak into that beating up and remind us of his grace, his goodness, his love for us. That nothing, nothing can separate us from that love. And a lot of Christians, I fear, live more defeated than they need to because they're not aware of the third thing that we need to watch out for. The trusting too much in people is the first, trusting the lies in ourselves is the second, and the third is the liar, the enemy, Satan, who knows your weaknesses. He knows what trips you up, and he will whatever way he can, seek to trip you up. Peter said the enemy is like a roaring lion seeking whom he may devour. And friends, if you are seeking to be faithful to God, the enemy doesn't like that and will seek to trip you up. Don't let his voice change your mind. So, Ak, only, only God is worth trusting completely. And in verse 8, the psalmist says, Trust in him at all times, you people. Pour out your hearts to him, for God is our refuge. He's been focusing on himself and his own problems, and then he realizes that he does find salvation, he finds hope, he finds strength, he finds refuge in God, so he encourages the people to do the same. And when it says, pour out your hearts, it's a plural. So he acknowledges that even though people can get in the way, even though people can betray us, we need each other. And we need to find people who are faithful to trust God. And work together to change each other and our own hearts. Monday night was probably the low point for me of this sadness that had enveloped me. And I was at the deacon's meeting, and at the close of the meeting, Martin Nemec prayed. And then he said, amen. And then he said, wait a minute, there's more. <laughs> and we prayed again, and he prayed for me. Maybe my heart was on my sleeve that night, and he could tell. But let me tell you something. When sisters and brothers gather with you and they lift you up and you lift them up and we put our trust together in God, it is a beautiful, wonderful, powerful thing. Thank you, Martin. And as we talk about faith and trust, it, I think it's very, very important there to address something that has happened uh, within the church and within our culture. And I'm not sure how it has. I remember it from even when I was a kid many, many, many years ago that what we, what we call Christian faith is, mo is often just a, an assent to some ideas saying, yes, I believe Jesus died. Yes, I believe Jesus rose again. Yes, I believe that he's coming again. And when we affirm our faith, that's a wonderful thing, and it helps us remind uh, our minds of these truths. But ultimately, faith is much more than that. It is trust. It is trusting God. 
Faith is not primarily assent to beliefs. It is a condition of trust located in the soul. The fundamental question to ask yourself about your faith is not, what do you believe? But whom do you trust? And what we believe, those ideas, should lead us to make this migration from our mind to our hearts, to know it, and because we know it, to trust. And this is an action of the heart, not of the mind. And a few weeks ago, I preached on fretting not or not fretting. And fretting, uh, we found, was that frantic, angry energy that so many people have when things aren't right. Uh, the psalmist says here, truly, my soul finds rest in God, finds quiet in God. If you are frantic, if you are fretting, then you are likely, very, very likely, separated from your trust in God. If you are feeling that you are no good, that you are useless, then you are separated from your trust in God. Find the quiet, find the peace that comes from trusting in the goodness of God. And this um, psalm is very poetic. It repeats phrases. It repeats ideas. Uh, we looked at the fact that we should not trust people to fill uh, the needs within us. We should not trust ourself. We should not trust the voice of the enemy. And then again, we find that we should not trust people to, be, to have the value that we often place upon them. Uh, in verse 9, Surely the lowborn are but a breath, the highborn are but a lie. And what that means is people that we don't really give much account to, they're just a breath. They're, and it, it, there's an image here in the psalm of weighing on a scale, and you put God on one side and us, anyone, on the other side, and we just, <laughs> the, the arm goes way up because there's really nothing there. The highborn are but a lie. We tend to think that certain people are way more important than other people, and we would think that if they were on the balance there, they would be more weighty, more important, more valuable, but that, the psalmist says, is just a lie. I am not a Harry Potter fan personally, but there is one who lives in my house, and it's not the dog. And I did find a very powerful illustration this week of this idea of us being just a breath of those who seem so important, ultimately, no. And that is, at the end of Voldemort's life, if you are a fan and you watch the movies, you might remember the image of Voldemort, the scary, scary one, who just starts turning to ash and just floating away like ashes from a fire and ends up being nothing. Now don't mishear this. God values people, God loves people. But people, as far as weighing against the power and importance of God, are nothing. And the glory of God, the wonder of God, and, and God's grace is that he puts value onto people and makes us something, makes us substantial. But don't let people, don't let people rob you of your joy. Don't let people rob you of your trust. And don't trust in wealth. Um, in verse 10, do not trust in extortion or put vain hope in stolen goods. In other words, don't value wealth so much that you're going to lie and cheat and steal for it and thus jeopardize your relationship with God. But then it goes on to say, though your riches increase, do not set your heart on them. Even if you are successful somehow, apart from lying and cheating and stealing, that, treat that as a blessing, but don't put your heart, don't set your heart on that. Because those things too are but a lie. They disappear. Only God. 
One thing, and this is verse 11, one thing God has spoken, two things I have heard, power belongs to you, God. Power. And with you is unfailing love. Unfailing love. And that's that word that I love to talk about, hesed. The, the word that means a love that never fails. A word that means a love that is anchored in the heart of God. And when, when God looks at you, he doesn't judge you by how well you're doing right now. He judges you by the love that is in his heart that sees none of those negatives because of what Jesus Christ has done for you. God is powerful and God loves you more than you can even imagine. So trust him. The end of the passage, the end of the psalm, might be confusing. It was when I first read it until I did some research about what it really means. It says, you reward everyone according to what they have done. And I'm like, well, I was always told that we're not recorded, uh, rewarded according to what we've done. Otherwise, we'd all be sunk. But we're rewarded by the grace of God through Jesus Christ. And, and it, it's important to separate this this sentence from our salvation. For yes, our salvation is in Christ. We are settled in that. But what the psalmist is dealing with is injustice. He's dealing with problems of people being unfair to him. And so when he closes out this psalm, he says, yes, I know that God will take care of these things. God will make it right. Crises have a way of causing us to reassess those things on which we have previously relied. They force us to seek a new foundation. Crises point out our vulnerability. And do you know that the word vulnerable comes from the word wound? It means woundable. We are all vulnerable. We are all woundable. But as we teach the kids at preschool, Jesus loves me this I know, for the Bible tells me so. Little ones to him belong. They are weak. Little ones, <laughs> we are weak, but he is strong. And the one who was invulnerable made himself ultimately vulnerable. Jesus Christ, who was at the right hand of God, never needing to experience pain, woundedness, hurt, or death, willingly stepped away from that position of glory, stepped into humanity, became vulnerable, had his friends turn on him, had his enemies seek to kill him and succeed. This is the love of God. This is the hesed of God. God has done this great thing so that you can experience his love. And God is strong enough to carry you through whatever it is that you're dealing with today. Trust him. Let us pray. Thank you, Lord, for your grace, for your strength, for your love. I pray for each individual in this room that there would be an interaction right now between them and you in which they give you fears, hurts, pains, doubts, and receive from you love and strength. 
I pray the same thing for us as we unite as your church. That we would find strength in you. It's not hard to find because it is right there. And we would live as those who know that we are made new. That nothing, nothing can separate us from you. And nothing is greater than you. And you have called us to yourself. Thank you. In Jesus' name, amen. May the God of hope fill you with all joy and peace in believing so that you may abound in hope by the power of the Holy Spirit and all God's people said, Amen. Amen.
so much. Anytime you're here, I will like